Okay, there we go. Um, so let's get started. Um, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, let's see here. Okay, so we're just gonna jump right in here. So um, a lot of people ask about um, cultivars or varieties. So you'll hear me use those two words interchangeably. And for those of you who are wondering why, um, for our modern day varieties that have been, you know, bred over the last, you know, 50 years or so, um, technically the appropriate word is cultivar, which means cultivated variety. Basically, it just means that, you know, that variety wouldn't exist without, you know, human influence. Um, so variety, cultivar, whichever one you prefer, um, it's fine by me. Um, but so you'll just hear me use those two interchangeably. It's kind of hard, hard habit to quit. Um, so thinking about cultivars and which ones to choose and, and how they kind of change over time, right? We, we have like old standards that eventually get phased out by um, seed companies. So thinking about how to choose new ones or, you know, assessing your old ones, right? Um, thinking about market acceptance. So of course you want to please the people who are going to be buying your cultivars, buying your product, right? So who are the end users and what do those end users want? So certainly I would imagine that if you're selling to a restaurant, um, that's going to be probably a different set of products compared to if you're selling on a farmer's market or you're selling on a farm, uh, farm stand, right? Or if you have a CSA, right, you may need a wider variety of products. Um, thinking about yield. So really, um, genetics plays a huge role in um, cultivars and, and what we see, right? Like the, the produce that is produced, right, that's grown and the fruit that we see. Um, but uh, the amount that is produced and the quality is often really heavily influenced by management. So um, making sure to get your um, soil samples in and really paying attention to what those soil test results um, show you is really important. Um, so there's, and you'll see when I present all these varieties, right, that there is a whole wide range of color and shape and diameter and length and um, flavor uh, across, you know, squash, right? And, and so it's really about preference and kind of sometimes it's about, well, I had really good luck with this last year, so I'm going to keep with this or, you know, my um, customers really enjoyed this particular variety. We couldn't keep it, keep it at the farmer's market. It was always selling out. So we're going to plant more of that, right? So paying attention to fruit quality um, is really important. And that's kind of when I'll talk a little bit about high tunnel um, uh, trials. And that's where high tunnels can really help that quality, um, just protecting the fruit from rain and uh, soil splash and wind. In, and so um, quality is really important. Adaptability. So um, it must grow well and yield high quality fruit under very environmental conditions, right? So we, we got a frost last year, I'm sure, you know, knock on wood, we don't have, we don't get it this year, right? But we got a frost in May, we got a really cold, uh, pretty intense cold snap last May, um, right, which was pretty intense for a lot of people. So um, did, did people's crops, um, fair okay during that or did they you know did they not stand the you know that few days of really intense cold weather um, and then of course right disease resistance um, thinking about um, really paying attention to the problems that you have over time and um, thinking about um, you know you may need to sacrifice yield or fruit quality or maybe a little bit of flavor to gain that disease resistance. Certainly breeders are really trying to avoid that, but sometimes that is the case, right? And there's that really classic example of that flavor saver tomato, right? It looked great, it packaged great, it tr could travel far distances really well, but it tasted horrible, right? And so I think the industry has really learned a lesson from that, 
but sometimes there is a there is a minor trade off. And so um, really paying attention to what diseases are common in your area and which ones you've dealt with in the past that's going to be really important in selecting um, diseases and or you know cultivars. And you know you don't need, for example, you don't need a cultivar that's resistant to root knot nematode if you've never had a root knot nematode problem, right? So just paying attention to that. Um, and then of course, disease incidence normally increases as the season progresses. So paying attention to, you know, not just at the beginning, but kind of throughout what happens, what changes um, is gonna be really important. So some of you may have seen this, and so I won't spend too much time on the variety trials of 2019, but because we're right in the thick of spring, um, beets, broccoli, lettuce, kale, those are all really great things to be growing right now, and it's not too late to, to <laughs> plant them. So you know, if you're thinking about it, go ahead. Um, so we did a high tunnel beet trial um, back in the spring of 2019. And so we did a whole host of different um, cultivars. So this avalanche one is kind of cool. It's white. Um, the Boldor also um, touchstone gold is very similar, right? And but we actually had uh, much better results with Boldor. Um, Kyogia is um, really popular. It looks like a peppermint on the inside, kind of. It's really popular. It's not super high yielding though. So something to keep in mind if, if that's um, something um, that people need or want, right? And then red ace versus red cloud. So uh, I know a lot of people are familiar with red cloud and this trial actually showed that red ace had a lot more um, productivity. So these are direct seeded, um, two inch spacing, um, all of the cultivars were harvested May 11th. They could have been harvested a little early. And so you'll notice the difference here, February 8th, May 11th, that's a pretty long days to harvest. Um, but keep in mind when you plant something really early, right out of its normal season, um, your days to harvest will be um, delayed. So um, we could have harvested a little bit earlier, but not that much earlier. And so these were the best of the best, um, Boro, Bresco, and Red Cloud. Um, excuse me, I, I got Red Cloud and Red Ace confused, Red Cloud. So, um, and so just thinking about marketable yield and marketable count, right? So if you're selling by the beat versus by weight, right? This may be of more interest to you than the, the total yield. And so just thinking about um, how you market your product and, um, you know, what's more important, the, the size necessarily, do you want a giant beet or do you want, you know, a lot of little beets? Um, for me as a consumer, um, for example, cabbage, right? So you see these giant um, heads of cabbage and growers really are proud of these giant heads of cabbage. And I really love cabbage, but um, I don't need a 16 pound head of cabbage sitting in my fridge, right? <laughs> so, you know, for those people that there's only two people at home or, you know, even three or four, maybe a giant head of cabbage isn't terribly useful unless they're making um, some sort of fermented product, right? Um, so thinking about that when you also, when you choose cultivars, right? So do I need the biggest, the biggest and the best or, or maybe just high quality and smaller options. So as I said, you know, adding at least 25% to days to maturity when things are outside their normal planting date, that is um, pretty typical. Um, there's, I know our CSA at UK does do direct seed or transplanted beets. Um, that's just from my perspective, you know, they, they do it because they need to guarantee a certain number um, in the field, you know, for their customers. Um, for a lot of people though, that might be an unnecessary added expense. So direct seeded, they do fine. Um, you may have to thin, you may have to reseed, but overall direct seeded does okay. So high tunnel direct seeded dates would be, you know, for the fall, September 15th to October 15th and spring, Fe February 1 to March 15th. So, you know, back those for field planting, 
you know, at least two weeks earlier in the fall and at least two weeks later in the spring. Um, and then, okay, broccoli. So uh, again, we did a high tunnel broccoli trial. And again, a lot of these things, um, they do really well in the high tunnel, for example, but it, it, that doesn't mean that they won't do well in the field. Uh, you may have slight quality differences, dep especially depending on the weather, right? But um, you should still have pretty good luck with these things in our region um, that they were evaluated. So keep that in mind. Don't um, You don't necessarily need to dismiss this because you don't have a high tunnel. Um, they, it can still be useful information. So we did one foot in row spacing and um, transplanted October 4th and harvested January 3rd, um, all but Imperial, which was harvested about uh, almost two weeks later. So um, we did use row cover for temperatures any pretty much below 34 degrees and we saw no cold damage. So again, if you had um, pretty thick row cover out in the field, you'd probably be okay here. You may again want to plant about two weeks earlier than we did in the high tunnel, but I think you'd be okay. They were slow to mature October to January, right? So pretty slow, um, but you could get the timing, you could make, get the timing right for, um, you know, a winter, a winter market. And so, so here Imperial did do the best as far as yield goes, but it was the slowest. So that is a trade-off. Um, Blue Wind did also did really well and um, Emerald Crown did pretty well too. And here's just some photos of what to expect. So that Imperial, that is not the lighting. It really was this very bright green color. So something to consider. Um, and so what we're looking at, so you can see um, this kind of the florets are popping a little bit. That's really, you don't want that. I mean, that would be um, a lower quality, right? Um, Arcadia had pretty good. Um, Emerald Crown again had pretty good. Um, the packed, packing of the florets, right? And Imperial did too. So transplant by mid-August for field or mid-September high tunnel, um, that would probably be, we, we planted a little late October, right? Late, uh, early October. And you can do in row um, spacing of single row or double row. We currently have broccoli out in the field, a uh, marathon cultivar that um, last year during all those different cold um, <laughs> spells that just kept coming, we did not use row cover once and they pulled through just fine. So we've had really good luck as um, cold hardiness, I, as a cold hardiness or heat tolerance, those are also really big factors to, to look into when choosing a cultivar, especially if you're gonna try to push the season a little bit, if you're, if you're um, trying to get an early start or maybe trying to hit a later market, something around Thanksgiving, for example, um, really a value, you know, take into consideration cold hardiness or heat tolerance. Um, so Marathon for us has worked really well as far as broccoli and we out in the field, we've planted it double row um, and it's done pretty well. So high tunnel lettuce and kale. So this, we're actually doing a full blown trial this year and comparing high tunnel uh, and field planted lettuce and kale. This was kind of a, just a mini trial. Um, everything was seeded in the greenhouse on September 16th, um, transplanted um, October 10th, um, and then harvested in December. And they did really well. Everything did really, really well. And I was, fairly impressed. We did need row cover, as you can see. We did use row cover, but the quality was really excellent. So as far as lettuce goes, Harmony, Sangria, Butter Crunch, and Pomegranate did well. Um, I don't have, we had another one on here, Dragoon, and that one did not do nearly as well as these other varieties. And so these are a one harvest Lettuce, uh, lettuce variety. They're not the cut and come again type. So it'd be a head of lettuce um, that you'd be harvesting. But as you can see, they're they're gorgeous. I take a lot of <laughs> I took a lot of pictures of lettuce 
um, that season because they, they're really pretty. Um, kale, we're evaluating, I think, five or six varieties of kale this year. Um, these three, I believe, are also in there. Um, and they did, you know, kale is, is tough, right? We know that. And it, and it did really well. And of course, you can get multiple harvests from, from kale. So um, another reason to have it around, right? Um, six inch, I'd say six to nine inch spacing apart, um, you know, or 12 if you want larger, larger leaves. Um, keep in mind what we, what we try to keep in mind is how hard it might be to um, weed. So in the previous photos, you saw that there was black weed mat down. This year, we're not using weed mat because we kind of did a trade off on, um, on a trial, on a big trial. It takes a long time to burn those holes um, in the weed mat. And so we just decided to forego it this year. So we're planting it a little bit more spaced out just to weed, be able to weed a little easier. And so for field planting, right, again, you'd plant, where'd my cursor go? There it is. Um, you'd plant uh, about two weeks earlier and two weeks later and you'd be okay. Um, aphids were the primary problem in the, in the case with both lettuce and kale. Um, you, yeah, usually 12 inch for head lettuce. Um, and see here we staggered. Um, this year we're planting them not staggered for, for weeding purposes. Um, but really it's all about preference and, and how you're gonna manage things. Um, carrots. So these were the ones that did the best. Um, carrot cultivars, um, this Napoli and Yaya are really popular um, standard carrots. Um, it, you know, it's hard to grow really straight, nice carrots like are in this photo, unless you have, you know, really well worked soil, um, tall raised beds or sandy soil. Um, you know, a lot of that, it is challenging. Um, but they do sell very well um, at farmers markets and CSAs. They, they are always a popular crop. Um, but early season weed control can be really tricky. And um, I think also many people don't quite water uh, uh, quite enough um, in colder weather. And so sometimes the carrots just don't um, develop quite as well as they could. Okay, so we're moving on. Those were kind of the cool season things that could be um, planted or seeded right now. Um, it's certainly not too late. Um, broccoli, you know, I think typical broccoli planting, we're early and we're, we're doing a study and it's um, early planting, mid planting and late planting broccoli and kind of looking at evaluation of pest, pest management uh, based off planting date. So your typical broccoli would be probably transplanted early April. Um, and so we're, we planted last week, we'll plant early April and then we'll plant three weeks from then. So um, it's not too late to most of those crops, it's definitely not too late. Um, so tomatoes, right? So thinking about um, when you're, where you're putting your tomatoes and um, thinking about what else, what other solanaceous crops are um, are going to be around or have been there. And then a lot of um, solanaceous crops also share similar diseases with cucurbits. So those really aren't good rotating um, partners, right? Um, solanaceous crops and cucurbits. So again, um, obtaining a soil sample is really important for a fruiting crop. Um, you may be able to get away with it without, um, with a leafy, leafy green or something like that, or even beets and carrots, but um, on a fruiting crop, cucurbits, solanaceous plants, um, a soil sample is really going to be helpful in determining what's, um, what any nutrient deficiencies you may have or excess nutrients that may complicate things later on in the season. So field tomato cultivars, <clears throat> the mountain series is still pretty popular. Um, the good thing about them is, is they can develop pretty early and they are fairly crack resistant. Um, Pony Express is a Roma type, right? It, it has a pretty short harvest window, window and, you know, it's supposed to have um, pretty small fruit, but I have heard from 
several growers that it actually is bigger than they would like. So, you know, and that I suspect is more to do with fertility than anything. Um, so again, thinking about what kind of fruit you want, right? What kind of crops you wanna produce and really dialing in that fertility. Um, so Red Defender, Plum Regal, Plum Crimson, um, Krista is also a, a good one for a long shelf life, a giant, um, giant fruit. And then the BHN series, of course, is, is really, is a very large, pretty large fruit, high yielding. Um, it pretty, it has a pretty um, decent amount of harvest days as well. So um, keeping that in mind. And then, you know, high tunnel tomato cultivars, um, thinking about Primo Red. The one thing with Primo Red that I have noticed, and you know, now the seed company, I didn't notice this on the seed descriptions um, earlier, but now it is being pointed out is it does have a slightly pointed blossom end. Um, and for the most part, that doesn't seem to bother anybody, but you know, it people have pointed it out and they some people don't like it as much. And so just be aware of that. Um, I'm not quite sure what that's about, or I don't think it used to be like that. Um, Red Deuce, uh, a really large tomato, smooth fruit, um, does very well. There's been some comments on flavor with Red Deuce as far as, you know, it's not nearly as flavorful. Um, I haven't looked at the total soluble solids on that, so I can't weigh in on that, on you know sugar content. But um, what I can say is we worked a lot with BHN 589 last year, and it did really well for us. And we got a lot of compliments on the tomatoes we we gave away from a trial. So um, again, BHN does pretty well. Rocky Top is a popular large um, large fruit. And then of course the Carolina gold, um, that yellow orange fruit, and it has pretty, you know, it's a large slicer and pretty uniform ripening. Um, some of these cherry, the cherry type sun gold is a, a very um, classic, um, but it is indeterminate. So here's um, a list of indeterminates and I'll kind of go through that just a little bit. Sakura, a large cherry. Um, Marbone is a beautiful um, French heirloom, a kind of a hybrid of a French heirloom. It is really lovely. And then of course, you know, most people know the big beef. So really people ask kind of what should I do, determinate, indeterminate. Um, you know, if you're a open field grower, I'd say determinate is the easier thing to um, to grow unless you've got some sort of infrastructure set up for trellising you know, serious trellising. Um, but the fertility requirements are pretty similar between the two. Um, really it's um, because of the concentrated fruit maturation, ripening, those, the magnesium, potassium, phosphorus deficiencies can become more common in the determinant cultivars because, you know, they get all harvested at once right? It's kind of a, a stress on the plant, or they get harvested in a short period of time, I should say, versus the indeterminate cultivars. You may need to space out um, nitrogen applications or just keep them going over the course of a longer harvest season. Um, so pruning, right? Over pruning, you can see this. Some of you may have seen this before, this leaf curl, um, it's usually, it's a you know, physiological disorder. It's not a, you know, biotic disease. And it's usually not, this is pretty excessive. And this is a stress, you know, an unnecessary stress to the plant. So um, hot weather, um, excessive pruning, this can lead to this. And, and really, um, as you can see, the leaves are kind of curled up. So there's probably less photosynthesis happening, which could um, affect, you know, fruit yield and development, right? High, there are high yielding uh, cultivars in both categories. So the total yield will, a, a lot of that will depend on the management and the cultivar choice. And really it comes down to um, labor, right? 
Um, so this short restricted branching, less pruning, concentrated harvest period, right? So uh, maybe if you have less, it, it kind of depends, right? If you've got, if you have a good chunk of labor for a short period of time, maybe the determinants are better for you. Um, if you're in a high tunnel and it's maybe just a few of you, uh, maybe an indeterminate type would be better. And so usually, you know, late March to early April for um, high tunnel planting dates in central Kentucky and the field planting date um, around May 5th to, you know, sometime in June. Um, and if you'll recall those people that thought they were in the clear for field planting in early May last year were, you know, unpleasantly surprised. But really we're looking at about somewhere between 4,200 and 5,000 plants per acre for open field planting. So typically six foot centers, um, a lot of times in the high tunnel, they're a lot closer than that. Um, I wouldn't recommend anything closer than 18 inches, um, even in a tunnel. I know, uh, I know a lot of growers actually prefer the two foot spacing in tunnels. Um, and then, you know, the closer spacing really may make it more difficult to manage pests and diseases. It may make harvest more challenging. Um, you may miss a lot of fruit just because you just can't see them, right? But really um, getting good coverage with a sprayer is really important. And if things are really clustered in there, it's hard. Um, and then less ventilation, of course. So peppers. Um, Red Knight, Courier, Charisma, El Rey, those are, you know, El Rey is a jalapeno, but these um, bell pepper types, um, there's a lot of really good bell pepper types out there. So I would encourage you to check out ID36, the pepper section. And um, all, all the varieties that, all the bell pepper varieties have been, that have been listed in ID36 have been tested in at least one location in Kentucky and sometimes more than one. So what, one thing that this is a big problem, this bacterial spot, right? And so um, this would obviously make this unmarketable um, for most cases, especially something this intense as this photo shows, right? So you're looking at Bacterial spot, there's races one through 10. So when you're selecting your um, your cultivar, right, for bell pepper, you'd look at, um, try to pick something that has good coverage, not just, you know, okay, resistant to bacterial spot, but how many races of bacterial spot does it have resistance to? And resistance, it does not mean it absolutely will not get bacterial spot, it just, will resist it pretty well. Um, for whatever reason, and I need to make a note of this, um, Ninja is not included in ID36, and I believe it is resistant to races one through 10. So something to keep in mind. Um, let's see. Oh, thanks, April, for popping that up, ID36. Um, okay. So uh, production recommendations, right? Transplant date, um, usually second week of April for central Kentucky. Um, it will, you know, peppers are not cold resistant at all. So I'd actually, um, if you know, be watching the weather and be willing to push that date back. Um, optimal growing air temp would be somewhere between 65 and 80. And they have a similar fertility um, to tomatoes, very similar. So be sure to check ID36 for that. Um, so again, soil pH and, and, um, and nitrogen requirements are very similar to tomatoes. And the spacing is fairly similar to tomatoes. So about 18 inch in row spacing, you can do double rows, um, staggered or, or um, or single rows. And then of course, with pretty much all vegetable crops, um, really consider um, you know, using some sort of plastic mulch or woven weed mat. Um, in, in most cases, they really help with um, increasing fruit quality and because there's just less splash, there's less, um, and there's also less weed management, of course. Um, and um, they generally, and, and higher soil temps. So 
melons. Um, so the correct term overall would be musk melons, but you know, in, in the US, we call most of them, a lot of them cantaloupes. So um, all cantaloupes are musk melons, not all musk melons are cantaloupes. So just a weird fun fact. Um, the fruit size varies, right? And so here are some pretty reliable um, melon cultivars. Um, there has been a lot of work done at um, Purdue on melon trials. And so you can check out this link here below um, if you're interested in looking more into that. And um, they're pretty, they do a lot of trials up there. Um, so thinking about the, you know, fruit size is of course a big a big component for a lot of people in choosing what type of melon they want, and then um, you know the flavor and the size. So Aphrodite and Athena, those are two really popular um, cantaloupe types. So fertility, right? Remembering. Again, most vegetable crops are somewhere in the you know 6.5 range, um, and the fertility is really important again for melons. Dialing that in, um, making sure you've got the um, pre-plant down, and then be either ready to side dress or fertigate. So we're looking at about 3,600 plants per acre. Um, six foot centers, they could be further apart than that. And then at least a 24 inch row spacing. Um, you can direct seed these. Um, you, know, you may want to double up on the seed just to cover your bases if you're doing direct seed, but um, transplant date would be May 10th to July 1. And really need to watch the soil temps, so at least 60 degrees um, before planting. So keep in mind, um, musk melons have male and um, uh, perfect flowers. The perfect flowers still need pollination. So one to two hives of bees um, per acre are recommended for pollination. Um, so, and then if you have bees, right, and you're really relying on pollination, make sure that you apply your pesticides. This is just in general, a really good rule for pesticide application in general. Um, applying pesticides late in the afternoon or early evening to protect pollinators. Um, pollinators are typically not as active in the evening. And so um, keeping that in mind um, when, you, when you're gonna apply something so you don't harm the things that are meant to help you, right, is a, is a good trick. So we usually don't spray before 6 p.m. Um, and then of course, needing that consistent irrigation um, you don't really consistent, not too much, not too little, don't overflow the system, right? And you can, or you can see some fruit cracking. So uh, a lot of, I get a lot of questions about harvesting and when to harvest. So um, you know when to harvest when the stem pulls away from the fruit and, and leaves that scar on the stem end. Um, if shipping, consider harvesting at the half slip stage. So it's firm, but not deeply colored. And that abscission layer between the stem and the fruit is only half formed. Um, so thinking about that and the fruit matures and ripens at different times. So multiple harvests are gonna be required, right? For melons and um, thinking about once you've harvest, getting them out of the field really quickly and where you can store them with the proper temperatures and relative humidity. Okay, so cucumber types, um, we've got monoecious, gynoecious, and parthenocarpic, right? So monoecious are, you know, the older cultivars. Um, they've got male and female flowers. Um, environmental stress can cause more male flowers to develop, and this can be a problem. Um, and then they spread out, they have a pretty spread out harvest period. The gynoecious, um, all female flowers, concentrated harvest period. Um, they're good for machine harvesting, which we probably don't have too much of in Kentucky. Um, they still do need pollination and, you know, need about 10 to 15% monoecious seed to help ensure pollination, right? So you need those male flowers. 
Um, and then the parthenocarpic, so female flowers, they're seedless, no pollination required, and um, they will produce seed if pollinated, um, need to be isolated, the seed's more expensive, and then, you know, usually we're talking about the burpless or the European types. So then further, you know, further, further categorizing these, right, we've got slicers for fresh market, picklers for processing, um, and they're managed, you know, in the field, they're managed the same as slicers, and then the burpless and the dwarf vine or bush, and then Armenian and Asian, and there's a whole, whole host of different um, cucumber types. So these are some really, um, you know, good cultivars, um, Corinto, Diva, uh, Lisboa, Excelsior. Um, and again, these two are picklers. These two are really long. And then these three are the slicers. So thinking about, you know, this is early and pretty productive. Um, the Diva has a pretty crisp, flavorful. Um, you'd want to harvest that when that's about five to seven inches long. Um, steady production from Lisboa. This one's very popular, um, an eight to nine inch fruit. So really you're, for cucumbers, it's a lot of people look for uniformity, right? You crazy, you know, curved, Kind of disfigured cucumbers; those don't those don't do as well for any of you know slicing or pickling. Um, so just keep that in mind. And a lot of that is management. So again, keeping that fertility in mind, raised beds are definitely recommended, um, and of course, plastic culture recommended or woven weed mat if you're if you're growing them in a high tunnel. So out in the field, you do, you know, about, you could get up to 20,000 plants per acre. The high tunnel planting date would be somewhere around the second week of April, and it, but it really depends on the soil and air temps as cucumbers are not cold hardy at all. Um, field transplanting date, May 5th to June 1. Um, and they can also be direct seeded. That would, you know, um, save you some money possibly hedge your bets if the weather's looking a little iffy, if the just seeds, you know, in the ground. Um, and it really to manage harvest periods and extend that harvest, um, it's recommended to plant these in intervals about every two weeks. So, you know, of course in the tunnel you'd need to trellis, um, but you can also do some pretty great trellising out in the field so this kind of, it looks like a volleyball net. Um, the brand I'm familiar with is called Hortnova. And this is, you know, easier, it kind of grows up and hangs on it and it's easier to harvest, it's easier to spray. Um, typically you get better fruit quality. It is of course more infrastructure, right? You've got to pay for this netting and put in the T-posts and all that. But um, overall it's, it's easier to deal with. Um, I do know people that grow cucumbers on the ground. I wouldn't recommend that just purely from a fruit quality standpoint and getting good spray coverage, right? I think you'll have trouble. So lots of harvesting is required um, as they develop. So every day or every other day, right? You've got to harvest. You don't want to, you know, giant cucumbers, right? Usually, um, about 24 hours of labor per acre would be about what you would expect. Um, and they scratch and, you know, thumbnails, um, all that kind of stuff can be, can be a detriment. So wearing gloves just from the scratching, avoiding scratching standpoint is a really good idea. Even just those, you know, nitrile or latex gloves. Um, and then getting them out of the field. So grading and cooling quickly. And a similar, um, similar uh, temp and relative um, humidity as melons, but I don't think I would recommend storing those two together because the melons are still ripening and they're still producing ethylene. So you wouldn't want those with your cucumbers. Okay, so this was a trial um, back 
early on when I first got here, not too, not too long ago, 2018, um, we did a high tunnel um, summer squash trial, just looking at new, um, new squash. Um, the, they were all pretty darn good, to be honest, but there were some differences. So here's some photos. Um, this one, Zephyr, I think is really gorgeous. It has this green end to it. Um, I've seen this in restaurants after I grew up myself, you know, and it was marketed pretty fancy in a meal. <laughs> um, the Tempest is also really lovely. It has these nice ridges and kind of a light, kind of almost kind of a striping of yellow and kind of a lighter yellow. And then of course, you know, Slick Pick is pretty the, the gold standard, I would say, or pretty standard squash. Um, gold Star was that actually uh, a very um, good um, yielding squash. Um, this Costata Romanesco, this is kind of a fancier one that may really appeal for, you know, farmer's markets or restaurants. Um, it's got this really giant blossom end, which may, you know, may not interest people. Um, as you can see how wide that is um, compared to the Dunja or the Spineless Perfection. So here's just some yield data so that um, you can see, let's see, I mean, I'm trying to move the thing out of my way. Um, so high yielding, right? This um, Dunja did really, really well, um, total marketable yield, um, and then the like one of the higher mean marketable yields per plot um, didn't have compared to so many of these other ones that did not have, I, I also like to look at the cold and unmarketable, right? Um, had really low cold fruit. Um, Tempest did pretty darn well, um, but as you can see, it had a lot of cold fruit. Um, Slick Pick, that standard did well and had pretty low cold fruit and um, you know, that Costata Romanesco that I mentioned, it was, you know, not great. Gold Star and Costata Romanesco did not do super well, but had really low cold fruit. So in general, they just yielded less, right? And then, um, you know, per plot per week, I think this is interesting from, a, you know, we, <laughs> we joke about, you know, leaving, people joke about leaving a zucchini on people's doorsteps and running away, right? You, it's like you can't give it away fast enough kind of thing. Um, so just having an idea of what you would produce in the course of a week, right? So um, I think we were harvesting um, three times per week and, um, so you can see kind of what you would expect. So things picked up, right? Slick pick got, got bigger over time, more over time. Um, Tempest definitely jumped, um, you know, so that first week, second week, third week. So, you know, spineless perfection had that big week in the week two versus week four. Um, so thinking about that, kind of just what to expect, right? So um, that might be might be helpful for people. Um, let's see here. So best performers overall, if you're just talking about highest uh, marketable yield, right? These were my, the top three. Um, but of course, um, you know, if everyone's got squash at the market, this one may not really draw any, and, and the same with Dunja, right? They're pretty standard, um, standard varieties, or they look pretty standard, right? So the Zephyr or the Tempest or the Costata Romanesco may be more interesting for customers, just depending on your market and, and where you are and what your customers want. So a few things to keep in mind, right? Um, they're in the cucurbit family, so just watch out as far as rotating. Um, Over-fertilizing, maybe over-irrigating combined with high temps, can cause this stem split that you see here. Um, we saw it, and if it's not, if you don't touch it, you don't touch the plant, you don't, you know, pull on it or you know mess with it. The stem will heal, and the plant will continue to produce. That was our experience, and so um, you know, don't freak out if you see it. As long as things are, you know, nothing's broken per se, um, you should be fine. Of course, as we all know. 
prepare for, you know, onslaught of cucumber beetles, um, squash bugs, aphids. Um, you've just got to be pretty much you put them in the ground and have your sprayer ready, <laughs> you know, the next day because that's it's they just have this sixth sense about them. Um, they will be all over the place, especially the cucumber beetles. Um, definitely early production is often better than later production from a disease pest management standpoint. So getting the squash in, getting your squash, you know, in and out of the field quickly, or be willing to do succession plantings to compensate for that loss from disease and pests, you know, that just, you can't help it sometimes, right? So this trial went on for a month and at after that month harvest, um, or, you know, we harvested for a month and after that, it, they were done. Like we could not, they were toast. So, you know, succession plantings and we managed them pretty intensely um, with pesticides and fungicides. And so even with that, all good things must come to an end. Um, so cultivars for sweet corn. So there are a lot of great updated varieties in ID 36, so page 38. Um, all the varieties listed have been evaluated for that tight shuck coverage over the tips, which is, is good for you know, keeping pests out, right? And keeping those kernels um, intact and, and looking you know, lovely. Um, many also have Stewart's wilt resistant, which is important after a, a warm winter. So there's an example of what you'll see with Stewart's wilt. If you're wanting corn earworm control, you're going to have to look at a BT variety. Um, and so there's attribute one and there's attribute two. These are genetically modified corn. Um, I spoke to Rick. Besson, the vegetable entomologist, and he's done extensive BT variety evaluations. And he said, you know, if you really want good corn earworm control, look for varieties that have that attribute too. And he has had really good luck with Remedy, Milky Way, and Aspire. So it kind of depends on the color, um, what you're what your um, clients or customers prefer. So some recommendations, right? Making sure that the soil is at least 60 degrees Fahrenheit before planting. Um, we see this every year, you know, somebody's trying to gamble or, you know, it warms up for a little while and then they just have really poor stand um, because it's, the soil is just not warm enough. And you need it to be even warmer if you're using those super sweet varieties. And so in ID 36, it is broken down on sweet, super sweet, BT. So you can see those, though they're genetically modified, you can see those differences. Um, it's corn is actually, sweet corn is a really great rotational crop with other vegetables because there's nothing else in our you know, vegetable realm that is related to sweet corn. Um, so it's, it's lovely for rotational purposes. Um, they really need, corn, sweet corn needs really well-drained soil that is absolutely essential. Um, you need about 10 to 15 pounds of seed for one acre. And so thinking about rows, um, 30 to 40 inches apart um, and in row spacing about eight to 10 inches. You really wouldn't want it to be any closer than eight inches um, to get decent size ears. And then, you know, you can, if you really want early, um, those standard varieties are a little are a little bit more tolerant to cooler soils. Um, so, but again, you'd be taking a gamble on, you know, some of that if you need, you know, for for example, BT corn earworm control. These don't have it. So, just some general um, ideas as we get ready for spring, or we're in the midst of spring, right? Um, we're thinking about next year even. Collecting soil samples in the fall is, is really the best bet for spring planting because if any pH adjustment needs to happen, you need at least six months. So whether you're putting down lime or you're putting down sulfur, you need about six months for that application, that amendment to take full effect. It also, if you collect that soil sample in the fall, um, 
it really allows you to, to kind of plan and think ahead and order this and order that, right? And you're not scrambling, um, you know, in March for an April planting. And so that overall for us has proven to be very helpful. Um, it also allows you to plan your rotation, right? What's going to go where, what came out and what can rotate in. Um, and thinking about getting ready for your most valuable crop, this is particularly helpful for high tunnel growers, right, with limited space. So um, if you've got lettuce now and you're moving into tomato, right, learning to manage that high tunnel and, you know, cut your losses on something that's less profitable, um, so you can put something else in, right, is, you know, you got to, you got to balance that decision making um, and learning uh, some things that we have learned the hard way, right, is have row cover handy, um, field or tunnel, right, it's really nice to have that ready to go in case of a cold snap. So you don't have to drive to Martins or Shrocks, you know, for row cover like you know, half the other growers in the state. Um, so, you know, even if you think you won't need it, it's, I'd say it's a few hundred dollars well spent, honestly, um, to have it, ha have it handy. And if you're something, I wouldn't buy anything less than, you know, ag Agribond um, 30. So that means 70% light transmission. It's a thicker, um, just in case, and preferably something like Agrabond 50, just to hedge your bets. So this is just some things to keep in mind, right? The average weekly prices for selected crops, just some things to kind of think about. Um, and the, you know, the rural versus urban, and then the overall average price, um, thinking about prices and, but also thinking about inputs and how much time it took you to, um, you know, put in these strawberries or put in these tomatoes and manage these tomatoes, right? Um, compared to something else like broccoli, right? So um, broccoli price is pretty high um, compared to, you know, once everybody has tomatoes, tomatoes are pretty, um, the price kind of drops some, sometime in July. So thinking about, um, how much labor, how much time, and and um, everything that goes into it, the infrastructure, right? Trellising, um, laying plastic, all that stuff. You know, calculate calculate in your time and time and energy. So I mentioned ID thirty six. Your county agent is an excellent resource. I'm sure you all know. Um, you've got a great set of county agents here tonight. Um, for those of you thinking about high tunnels, um, hightunnels.org is um, a very good, you know, initial resource um, for people just still contemplating that. Um, and then, of course, the UK Center for Crop Diversification, um, crop profiles, current prices on products, um, also um, fact sheets and um, kind of, I can't, the words escape, escaping me, but it basically is helping you kind of uh, the economic profile of the crop is what I would call it. Um, very, very useful information at the CCD. And for those of you who haven't seen this before, this is a high tunnel planting calendar. Um, there are three regions. So if you find this, um, you can just type in UK high tunnel planting calendar. I'm sure that will pop right up. Make sure you find your region. I'm, I think all of you would probably be in region two. Um, but yeah, it just gives the Kind of a range of planting. It's pretty conservative. So for those of you who kind of like to take a risk, um, you may you may find that you you know you can plant a little earlier or a little later than than this calendar suggests. And I think that's about it. Yes. So with that, I will take any questions. If anyone wants to come off on mute right now, you're more than welcome to, or you can put your questions in the chat box and we will read them.
Hey, hey Doc, can you uh, mention something about Blossom Enrot? Yes. So I actually had that slide in here and I thought I was going to go too long. So that was my, that was one thing I dropped from my PowerPoint. Um, so Blossom and Rot, it's a strong, uh, it's uh, often mis misconstrued as, um, oh, I need to put, you know, everyone knows it as a calcium deficiency, which it is. But um, most people make the connection that, oh, then I need to, um, apply more calcium to my soil, I need to do a calcium application, which is not really the case. So with blossom and rot, um, it is the plant, you probably have plenty of calcium in your soil. I've never seen a Kentucky soil test that didn't have plenty of calcium in the soil. So anything over 800 pounds per acre on your soil test, you're fine. Um, there may be plenty of calcium in the plant itself. So common problem in tomato, um, but often, but other solanaceous crops too, it is getting calcium to the fruit. So, and which is a, a water stress and heat stress issue, right? So transferring that calcium that's in the, maybe in the soil up through the roots to the fruit, that is where the, the hitch is. And so that is where really consistent irrigation helps. Um, if you have perpetually had blossom and rot problems in the past, um, I would encourage you to think about um, an irrigation timer, right? And also shade cloth. So 30% shade cloth would be um, very, would probably help you along a lot as far as avoiding those, you know, unmarketable tomatoes with blossom and rot. Um, yeah. So I see that a lot. It happens every year. We are we ourselves, you know, with our um, tomato trials, have had issues. Um, we actually had more blossom and rot at the beginning of the season, um, right when stuff like the first set of fruit, first crop of fruit, than we did later on. And I think part of that was we just quite we weren't qu watering quite enough at the beginning, right? It was cold, cool soil. Um, I think it just wasn't quite enough water um, going to the plants. Thank you. Anyone else have any? Oh, sorry, I hurried off. No, you're fine. Um, do you want to go before people jump off? Um, and I will be happy to take more questions as we wait. Do you want to go ahead and throw the poll up? Yes, I will do the poll. Um, we did have one question came up. It is. What are your thoughts on Roundup Ready sweet corn? Oh, um, oh, I don't see the question. It must have been to you. Um, Roundup Ready, Ready sweet corn. So yeah, um, as many of you may have heard, Roundup uh, resistance is a real issue. Um, I haven't tested these varieties myself, but um, you know, if you have a if you have a you know real weed problem, um, I would consider it for sure. Um, but certainly think about rotation and cover cropping as a way to manage weeds and sweet corn. Um, you know, consider that as part of um, part of your production practices. Um, it's I don't think Roundup Ready sweet corn is going to solve all your weed problems. Let's put it that way. So I think they do fine. Um, it's definitely something we should, I'm glad somebody brought it up. I think it's something we should address in ID 36. We're going to, so every two years we update ID 36. So um, I'll make a note to kind of make, you know, a devote a paragraph to it and possibly um, address the cultivars for Roundup Ready. But ultimately I don't think it's going to solve all your weed problems. Perfect, all right, I'll go ahead um, and launch the poll. So this may be some of your all's first time ever doing a poll, uh, but you'll see it here in a second. All right, you all should be able to see the poll now. Answer these few little questions. I'll give you a, a couple minutes to do it. Um, also be thinking about if you have any more questions for Dr. Rudolph. 
And, you know, feel free if, you know, a question pops into your head later, feel free to, you know, let one of these excellent county agents know and they can get in touch with me. Um, so, uh, and this polling really just helps me kind of gauge where, you know, was this a, was the presentation spot on? Was, do I need to work on something? Do I need to tweak something? You know, that kind of thing. So um, just helping me gauge my audience and, and, and um, adapting. Good deal. Um, we did have another question come in to me. It says, uh, for any crops you would not recommend to grow on plastic? <laughs> um, asparagus, <laughs> pretty much, you know, plastic culture, it is, um, and there's no escaping it, right? This plastic, plastic has been revolutionary for vegetable production and horticulture in general, right? And um, there are very few crops that do not do well on um with plastic culture. Now, there are several crops that do just fine without it. Um, sweet corn, right, does, does fine, right? It, we, it's becoming more popular growing um, sweet corn on plastic, but it also, you know, there's, a, I think the majority of sweet corn growers do not use plastic. Um, pumpkins, pumpkins do okay without plastic. Um, sweet potatoes, Potatoes, those also do just fine without plastic. Now, again, all of them have been utilized with plastic culture, um, but those do just fine. And there are a lot of growers that are very successful without plastic culture. All right, um, we are at 15 of 22 folks that have voted. Um, I haven't had any new, oh, we have a couple of people just pop on the call. I'll leave it open for a few more seconds. Get your last minute uh, folks in on this poll, and then I'm going to share the results here with everybody. And for those of you, I see some of the results already. Um, so my, you know, my focus is primarily with um, commercial, um, commercial production, right? And so that's why I reference a lot of, you know, markets and clients and that kind of thing. Um, and so that, it, that's why, I don't think I said that in the beginning, but that's why. All right, any last um, questions or anything that you all have for Dr. Rudolph? You're welcome to come off on mute. This is your time, time to shine. Time to shine. All right, well, if you don't, and if uh, you get off the meeting tonight and you think of something later, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or your agent. Um, of course, we're right there at the ear of Dr. Rudolph all the time. She helps us tremendously answer any questions that we may not be able to answer. Um, so just let us know. Also the ID 36, I did put that link in the chat earlier, but if you, want a copy of that, um, you are welcome to stop by or call your county office to see if they have one for you. Uh, those of you all in Fleming County, we have uh, plenty of them right now. So uh, just let me know if you need any. We have those available. Um, and then also I'll email out uh, to everyone all the resources that Dr. Rudolph shared with you all this evening as well um, so that it'll be easily accessible for you all. Um, any other last notes? That anyone can think of. Um, if you did not put uh, in the chat box who you have uh, watching with you during this evening, uh, can just put down the name of anybody you have watching with you. I can see pretty much all the participants, but we just want to make sure we have um, everybody taken care of for being on this evening. It helps us with our numbers as well. Our next meeting will be on April the 6th, um, and it'll be virtual again. And again, we'll have Sharon Spencer with the Kentucky Department of Agriculture on. She'll give KDA program updates and uh, also some marketing ideas for you at market. So other than that, um, anybody else have anything, any questions, last minute questions, agents, you have any last minute tidbits? All 
All right. Well, Dr. Rudolph, we appreciate you being on this evening and helping us get ideas on uh, fruit and vegetable varieties. It's really good. And we look forward to, to uh, seeing everybody and answering any questions you have and a good year for Commerce Market in all of our counties. Yeah, good luck, everyone. All right. Thank you all. I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you. Everyone have a good night.